Hi guys, good afternoon. I can see many of you are starting to come in now, but I'm not sure if you can hear me. So as that list fills up, could someone just pop in the chat whether or not you can hear me? Okay, I'll open the chat so I can see. Hi Dave, thank you. Thank you guys, that's very, very useful to know. So you can all hear me, all we'll do then. So we'll give it a couple of minutes, go and grab yourselves a coffee um, and let me just check as people flow in and when it starts to slow down, that probably means everyone's in and we'll be okay. It says 46 people are in, which is a really high number actually, but I know that the list had 170. So I'm gonna give him a few more minutes in case there's a few more people that wish to join. Now, while that comes through as well, can you tell me in the chat whether you received the handout that was circulated probably 10 or 15 minutes ago? Please. Yeah, thanks Dave, Dave you're on this, I'm telling you. Thank you guys, I can see all the responses coming through saying yes, thank you guys. Cheryl says she didn't. Um, Cheryl, can you do me a favour, whoever sent you the link, um, or in fact, I'll put my email address in the chat, and then if you just drop me an email, I'll, I'll attach the handout for you. There we go. So everyone should now see my email. And then if you don't have it, just drop me an email and I'll attach it. And we'll start in a couple of minutes. So, cause after that, I won't be able to attach it cause I'll be talking. So, so make sure you send the email now. Okay, let's make a start then. So thank you um, all for attending. Thanks for taking an interest. My name is Reagan Fassad. I am one of the barristers at Spire. Um, I do well, pretty 100% care. I don't do anything else. And in particular, a, a large part of my practice is local authority work. So I, I thought I would put on this seminar really um, to provide, as it says, an overview of the law. But I, I wish to say in advance that A, if you've got the handout, you have a lot of detail there that I would advise you to read in your own time because there's only so much we can go through in the 45 minutes. Um, and B, when I prepared this, I prepared it with this in mind. When you act for local authorities, <clears throat> um, a lot of the time when it comes to NAIs, the social worker, the team manager, the practice supervisors, the service managers, can get a very um, entrenched way of thinking about um, injuries and how to deal with them and what the law says and what should happen. What should happen is probably what I should say. And actually this handout was prepared with this in mind, with if you ever have one of those, I would advise that you send this handout to the team that's working on that case. Because from my own experience, and I say this for myself, and then I'm going to ask you if anyone else has got an experience of that. Can you just tell me why I'm losing my mind or if it happens to all of us? 
you get an NAI case, you, you know what the law is, you'll all know this law, I'm sure, I assure you, or you'll know most of it, but you get quite entrenched in the way that the client department thinks, which is something's happened, something has happened here, I believe she's done it, he's definitely done it, you know, even if there's nothing against the family, the expert says this is this, and so it must be that. And sometimes, because you work on the case a lot, you can get caught up in their way of thinking as well. And it's happened to me quite a lot. And so what I do as a practitioner is every time I get one of those cases land on my desk, um, I make sure that I reread this little summary of the law that I made for myself. Um, but also, just before IRHs, just before final hearings, just before threshold is finalised, I always just flick through it again to make sure I understand these principles. And I tend to find that if you give it to the client department really early on and go through it with them, you'll find that their way of thinking as the case progresses and how entrenched they get in their thinking can change. Um, so for me, I prepared this with that in mind, that actually it's a good refresher for us as lawyers, but also it's a useful document and that it's quite easily explained. I like, I like to think I pull it together in an easy way that it can be conveyed um, to pass on to the client department once you get one of these cases and say, look, this is where it's at. Just get this in your head because this is how the court's going to look at it. And it can start to change the way they think very early on. So what we're going to do today is we've got some learning objectives. We're going to understand the basics that I say still apply to these kinds of cases. But there are also some basics that actually you probably don't see very often unless you've got an AI come up. And so we're going to cover those and how that plays its role. And then we're going to understand a little bit of what happens with expert evidence. And I, I specifically will come back to that because I think that's important. A lot of client departments treat the expert evidence as the word of the law. Um, and actually it isn't. And I think we need to have some cases ready to show them that that's not the case. So before we get into that, can I ask, am I going crazy? Or sometimes do you get entrenched as well, where you start to think like the client department do, and you think, gosh, it's nice just to come back and look at the law, remind myself that's not how the court looks at it. Am I the only person who has that problem? And if you don't want to shame yourself, just put it privately to me so I can see as I do this that I'm not the only person. That will reassure me a little bit. Um, so yeah, so let's turn to the basics whilst you do that. We have, you'll all know about the standard of proof and the importance of primary evidence, but I thought I'd recap on that. We have the matter of X, and again, X is just a case I picked, but there are many cases that re reiterate these principles. l &M certainly does. The burden of proof is on the authority, and that applies just as strongly, I will say, in cases of non-accidental injury. If so, the court's looking more closely at that when it comes to these injuries. We got the balance of probabilities that we still have to apply. Um, findings of facts must be based on evidence, not suspicion, and that is important for client departments to understand. Um, when considering cases of suspect child abuse, the courts must exercise an overview of the totality of the evidence. Now that will come back to in terms of experts. The opinion of the experts need to be considered in the context of all of that. The court has to stay, make sure that experts stay within their expertise. The evidence of the parents and the carers are of utmost importance. A witness may lie for many reasons. And there, Mumby P also comments on um, legal concept of the balance of probabilities must be applied with common sense. Inherent probabilities are still a thing. It doesn't mean for a moment that just because something is unlikely to have occurred that it's impossible. And the court has to weigh that into the balance. And that the fact that a respondent fails to provide an affirmative case um, does not in itself establish the local authority's case. Now we will come back to that. That to me was an overview. Let's break that down. So we have the, the points that I think are important, improbable events. So the inherent improbability of an event occurring. So when you've got your experts in these cases saying, um, I think it's unlikely that this is something that could have happened naturally, but I'm not ruling it out. I think it's more likely that this someone broke this child's arm, for instance, that they inflicted some high degree of force um, and it has to have been reckless or intentional, um, the court still in that balancing exercise has to consider that unlikely does not mean impossible. And I think we have to reiterate that and understand that ourselves. So now the fact that something is very common or uncommon lowers the standard. We then have the importance of primary evidence. Now, I cover this over and over in a lot of my lectures because I think this is so important. RE-A, and everyone knows what RE-A says, is that if the authority relies on something, it has to reduce proper evidence and it must establish a link between the facts and the child. Let's start with the proper evidence. If you as the solicitor with conduct gets an NAI case, I, whenever I pick it up really early on, I take this view as I review absolutely every piece of evidence to find to come with the aim of going, what do I need a statement from for? What do I need a social care note for? Because at the end of the day, 
that will be the evidence when it comes to finding a fact or composite final hearing. So for instance, in a lot of these cases, you get um, early records from the officers or early on Annex H disclosure where they've made notes of things on their system saying, spoke to mom on the night on 11.36, mom said this, this and this which you will then look at and think, oh, that's slightly different to what she said in her statement. Now, that is your point to go as the lawyer, oh, we'll need a statement from that officer. Because if mom gets in the witness box and that is later put to her finding a fact and she goes, no, I never said that to the officer, then sadly, the, the local authority's case is in difficulty in trying to say that there is a discrepancy there because we don't have primary evidence to show the judge to say, no, you can rely on the officer but that he has accurately recorded what the mother said. And so as the lawyer in the case, I always think, just remember re A, remember the need for proper evidence. Is there anything in that bundle that you think they refer to that discussion between mother and social worker or mother and police where mother said something different? So-and-so accused the mother of this, then get statements from those people, get your primary evidence lined up because be conscious that in re A, if the parents challenge it, we're in difficulty in proving it. The second thing is the, the local authority must establish a link between the proving facts and the child. Now, I will come back to that, but I raise that because I've seen many thresholds drafted where you get the, the wording of it, where they, they, they don't really prove anything, where they're not seeking to prove anything that is relevant to risk of harm. So, for instance, recently I had a case where I was for the child um, and the authority put in their threshold and one of the threshold findings they sought was that um, neither parent had explained the injury. Now, you know, as well as I do, that that's not a risk of harm. And actually, as we're going to go through this, we're going to discuss, of course, that there's no burden on the parent to explain anything. Um, and so that, to me, was not a proper finding for the authority to seek. And I raised it with them. They kept it in and the judge threw it out and criticised them in the judgment. But I did raise it with the authority to try and say, look, actually, take that sentence out because you're not helping yourself. So just remember that we always have to link these things. If you instruct counsel that you expect the threshold to link the incident or the occurrence or whatever they're alleging, to the risk of harm to the child. Um, of course, if you don't manage to get statements, sometimes you have to rely on hearsay evidence and some things are proper hearsay evidence to rely on. My view is this, always try and get the best hearsay you can. So if the social worker, um, one of the social workers had a discussion and then you find out that social worker doesn't work for the authority anymore, get her case note of that and file that. That is as best as you're gonna get in terms of evidence. Um, to support whatever that discussion says that might be relevant. Think about, okay, if I can't get the primary evidence, that person isn't there that I can get a statement from, what's the best or the closest I can get in terms of hearsay? If you can get secondhand or firsthand hearsay, it's obviously better than sixth. Um, and so that's what I think. And of course the court gives it what weight it considers appropriate, um, but we all know that hearsay evidence has to be looked at anxiously so with anxiety with care because we people make mistakes we know that and I think when you plan in these cases and you're early on trying to plan and guide the client department remember that have that at the back of your mind remember to say to them look if you speak to mom and dad make a contemporaneous note when you get back make sure you produce a short statement saying this is the note I made here it is so that they know it's part of their working with the family when they're evidence gathering, which I know that's not the main intention, but through social work and that is what they do, um, that it's properly done and you can properly evidence to the best of re that you possibly can. Um, remember, of course, the binary system still applies, but then this is important and I include this because you get a lot of social workers who do say, um, I think something might have happened there. <laughs> And, and you go off on these huge fact-finding exercises because something might have happened. Just always remember them that there is no room for that. There is either it happened or it didn't. But also, um, if then the court explores this at fact-finding and rules someone out, um, or, or take, doesn't put someone in the pool is what I should say, not rule someone out, doesn't put someone in the pool, then they have to treat that as conclusive. That person didn't do it. There's no, that person might have been involved. That, that's the end of that, even if they have those suspicions. Um, Baroness Hale says, of course, now the seriousness, seriousness of the allegation or the seriousness of the consequences should make any difference to the standard of proof. And I raise that because I've seen a lot of service managers who take the view, this is so serious that, you know, we have to be 
looking, reminding the court that it's so serious when they will come to consider it. Of course, that doesn't really make a difference in this. Every child abuse case is serious. Every injury is serious. Every instance of neglect or abuse is serious. Um, and no doubt, see, this is why this handout, I think is useful for them to read at an earlier stage. And then they get this in their head and they start to think like that as the case progresses, which is really helpful. Um, so, this one is important. If there is a doubt, then resolve it in favor of the party who has an allegation against them. So the local authorities fail to discharge the burden. That's important because they need to understand again, and if the proper evidence isn't before the court and the court therefore can't make the finding um, or doesn't believe that the um, standard is properly met, then it, it, it works in favor of the parent. We are the applicant, we have to prove it sadly. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's useful for them to know in terms of how to gather their evidence as they work through the case. Now, I'm going to just ask again, if you've got any questions there, just let me know, I'll open the chat. No one's said anything yet. Are you all hearing me? Let's hope you're all hearing me and I haven't just covered that whole section without any of you hearing me. Oh no, no one's saying anything in the chat. All good, there we go. Thank you, Dave, you're my star pupil today. You're staying on top of it with it. Thank you guys, okay. So again, if you've got any questions for what we've just said, just let me know. But hopefully that's just a refresher, really, for most of you, if not all of you. So let's look at what's more specific to NAI. That sometimes I think when it comes to planning and thinking about it, coming back to these basics really helps. So here we have um, the evidence of the parents or the carers. There's no student burden for a parent to come up with an explanation. And again, that links back to that case with Threshold, where, where the authority got absolutely slated in the judgment. For something I'd pointed out to them, which is, the fact that a parent can't proffer an explanation is not evidence of guilt. I mean, it's part of the overall picture for the court to consider the parents as evidence, but it doesn't lead to guilt. And therefore putting it in threshold was completely inappropriate. Um, the burden of disproving a reasonable explanation put forward by a parent is still on the authority. So if they do come up with something and it might fit the evidence and the explanation, then the authority has to disprove what they've said so for instance, a very good example of that is, I had a case um, whereby um, at the last minute, dad came forward and said, oh no, I did. I think I did this. And basically he gave an explanation that fitted with the expert's account of a possible scenario. Um, of course, in cross-examination, I put that to him, I put the point that, you know, you didn't come forward with this explanation until we knew what the expert was saying. And it's quite almost identical to a scenario that the expert said could have caused this. Um, sadly, putting it to him and his responses wasn't enough and the judge decided the local authority had not discharged the burden um, of disproving something he had said. Um, and it was because he was so credible. I mean, these NAI cases, we always get parents who are so credible, so, so um, squeaky clean, if I could put it like that. No drug misuse substances, no history of lying. And so the judge decided that actually I didn't discharge, we didn't discharge the burden simply because we couldn't, because we couldn't find anything to say that this man was lying. You know, it was something I put to him, but putting to him isn't enough. So that's a very good example of how that can come back to hit the, the authority. And it's something we need to think about in our planning of how we pursue a case, that that will stand against us, sadly, that if we can't dispute, prove something they say, should we pursue it? Um, and then of course, the evidence of the parents and of the carers of the utmost importance, which I think we've already talked about. I'm not going to cover lies in any specific detail. You all know Lucas lie. People can lie for many reasons. Um, and that, that is just what it is. And, and a lie is not evidence of guilt in itself normally, or not all the time. Memory is one that sometimes we need to think about because sometimes I think we forget that, of course, not when I say we, I mean the, the client department. So it's, it's advice for you to pass on that people sometimes don't always lie, that the memories just fade and they change things because they're trying to fill in gaps when the memories are fading. Um, and that, you know, it says here two common and related errors are to suppose that the stronger and more vivid is our feeling or experience, the more likely the re recollection is to be accurate. And that the more confident a person is in their recollection, the more likely that their re recollection is to be accurate. Neither of those are true, sadly. Um, and again, that can sometimes come back to, have you got that statement from that officer that mom said something to? Because the judge may well turn around and go, A, you haven't got primary evidence because no statement. And B, how do I know that officer's memory isn't wrong about it? So we can end up working against the authority, though, which is why I say grapple with it early, 
pull all your statements together, just get them in. Um, okay, so that's memory, and we won't cover that in loads of detail, because I know you all know about that in detail already. Um, let's turn about to um, when you get these cases come in, you get them, you get all your experts on board, and you take it to a finding of fact hearing. And I think it's important for us to understand as lawyers, and to feed it back to the client department, the thinking process that the judges have to go through when they get there. So, identifying someone who could have caused an injury, a perpetrator, has to be done on the balance of probabilities, that's obvious. But I think it becomes um, a little bit more tricky when the judge can't identify a specific person and we cover the end, the, the realm of pool findings, um, who is in the pool of perpetrator. Now, it, when I was more junior, it took me a long while to get this around my head. But in essence, where the court has, what the, what the judge has to do is sit back um, and try to identify everyone who could have caused this injury. And then from that pool, decide if there is a specific person that they can say caused this on the balance of probabilities. And if they can't do that second step, decide who could have caused this on the balance of probabilities, then those people remain in the pool. Um, and that's how that thinking process has to work, which means that in terms of where we're at, it doesn't start out with everyone who was in the house was in the pool. Um, it, for the judge has to start out with what evidence is there to show that that X, Y, Z person um, could have caused this. It was a real possibility that they caused it. And then once you have that short list to then go, can I identify the perpetrator? That means that there may well be people in that house who the court has to say, I don't think the evidence is there to say that they could have caused this, that there was a real possibility that they could have caused this. Um, and so you can get people who are excluded um, because there was a lack of evidence to take it to that next step of real possibility that they could have done this. Um, and I, I write, write all the case law out there in quite some detail, because of course, there's this issue identified in Rebe of re reversing the pool, reversing the burden. If we go, everyone in that house is in the pool and then we have to exclude them out in our thinking. Well, no, the judge has to do it the other way around. Everyone in that, of everyone in that house or setting, um, who could have, who, who, who is there a real possibility um, could have caused this injury or who, 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 I'm explaining that badly, but you get the idea we start with, no one's in the pool. Then we step up to who are the people who there are, there's a real possibility could have caused this. And then once you have that short list, then you go on the balance of probabilities who caused this. And if they can't make that second jump, that's how you get your pool finding. Now for me, I found that really hard to get around my head when I was younger. So I hope that, that makes a bit more sense to everyone. Can you just take a moment and say in the chat and I'll look now, do you need me to explain that a little bit better or does that make sense? No one said anything. So I don't know if you need me. Makes sense. Thank you, Lorna. That's Lorna. Thank you. Okay. And again, I'm sorry if I'm telling you to suck eggs. A lot of you probably already know this, but I hope that it's 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 useful to go over it again, just to refresh your memory on that. Because sometimes, you know, when you speak to the client department, they don't get that. And they almost put everyone in and then start to take them out one by one. And I think it would be helpful for them to understand, no, A, you have to have evidence to put someone in. There is something there that says there was a real possibility they could have done it. And B, just because they're a real possibility doesn't mean the court is able to make that next step of who caused this. Sometimes you have to settle for a pool finding. Now, we all know as lawyers, sometimes these cases get to pre-trial reviews to IRH, and the judge encourages us to take a view on whether we could take it the next step, which is we might be able to accept a pool finding of who's in the pool. Can, can we go further to point the finger at someone and say, you definitely did it? Because at that point, you do have to think, do we take a pool finding? And I would say that's why this thinking process, this reasoning and this understanding of the, what the judge will have to do is important for us to understand ourselves so we can convey back to the client department because we have to explain that to them to say, look, from the evidence in front of us, we can see that there's a real possibility these people might be in, but we, might, we won't be able to make the next jump because if you can't make the next jump, then that's your room for starting to think about, do we accept a pool finding here and let the matter rest at that? Now, I'm... I, I, I'm, I'm one of those barristers, I don't like accepting findings. I sort of think, run it and let the court decide. But I know that there are other people out there in other circumstances where that has to happen. And so it's useful to know that. Um, okay, let's turn to going down my law. Look at all that law I've given you on that in the hope the client department will understand it. Um, failure to protect. Now, this is an interesting one because I think we all always want to knock on a failure to protect, don't we? We've got mum and dad in the home and dad is is a violent alcoholic, then we always go, oh, mom failed to protect. 
<laughs> I was sticking in threshold and trying to pursue it. And don't get me wrong, I am all for sticking it in threshold and trying to pursue it. For those of you who do instruct me, you know how long my thresholds can be. I'm all for just going for it. And then if we fall short, we fall short, or we put it the best we can. Um, but of course, when you put someone um, up for failure to protect, if you accuse someone of failure to protect, there has to be evidence that they knew something that could have made them think, oh, no, that person can hurt that child. And therefore, based on what I know, I have failed to protect. And if you can't do that, then it's not, it's just, it's it's not a bolt on finding you should add on. So for instance, I had a case where I, um, I put in a failure to protect for dad on the basis that mom had some stress levels. Um, it says, which section are we on? So for me, I'm on page seven, failure to protect at the bottom of that page. Is everyone there? I hope you are. Um, good. Um, so I put it on on that case. Dad was pretty much squeaky clean. Mom had some high stress levels on the basis that she was going up for surgery. Um, and so, we, and there was a chance she might die when she got on that table. And I argued, well, she was one who was a little bit more stressed because she knew that was coming up. It was a very weak case. We had very little evidence in general. <laughs> So I was quite impressed that I was able to string my argument together. Um, and I put a failure to protect on dad, that if mom did this, mom's dad failed to protect. And the judge actually was quite scathing about it on the basis of, you can't just stick it in. Just because she's got a bit of stress with the surgery coming up does not mean that that man would have known she'd have physically broken that child's arm. Do, do you see what I mean? Um, so we, I think RELW is really good for that, in that you can't just stick it in as a bolt, up, bolt on finding. There has to be a causal link between what, what that person knows or should have known and, and the event actually occurring or the possibility of the event actually occurring. Um, so fairness protect is an interesting one. And again, I mention it um, because you, you get when council drafts thresholds, I'm really, really bad with, with like, it's not bad, what's the one for? I'm really, really particular with how I draft thresholds. Those of you who instruct me will know that. And in particular, I always only put in what I think we can evidence. And if, if I put something else in, I will discuss it with you beforehand so you know that issue. The reason I mention this is, please, when you get counsel's drafting threshold for you on these cases, or you draft it yourself, remember that. Remember that, but don't stick that in unless you can actually evidence that there is something there. Um, because, of course, we get these NAI cases where we do get our violent, aggressive, alcoholic dad or mom or grandma. But we also get so many of these cases where the parents are squeaky clean and you sat back thinking, oh, what do I actually put against them? Try and avoid failure to protect you things if you just cannot prove it because you will get criticised. RE-LW is very good for criticising authorities for doing that. And so it's worth a read when you get the chance. Um, so before we move on to expert evidence, I just want to recap on this as to why I've decided to put this all together, um, these particular two pieces and what relevance it has. So I want you to think for a moment, now that we've refreshed our memory on that, what are the factors that are relevant? Well, I think it's relevant for these reasons. If you've got that case where the parents are squeaky clean, it's important to remind the client department and so at least to manage expectations, even if they decide to pursue it, to manage expectations that the burden is on us, that um, the parents don't have to, to disprove anything, that if they put forward a possible in injury, um, explanation even, um, it's on us to disprove that. And that if there is a little bit of evidence of them being dishonest, we need to put the proper evidence before the court because especially for those squeaky clean parents where you'll only have one instance of them having possibly been inc incoherent or inconsistent in the account, you want to make sure that um, you get the evidence together because that might be the only point you're able to make. Now I know representing authorities, I know that they don't want to back down about these things, that they don't want to withdraw, that they're worried about carrying the risk by doing so. And I entirely accept that I'm not one to push them, but I think that they should understand those difficulties so that expectations are managed. Because I'm sure I'm not the only lawyer who's worked in cases where you get the, I think mom's done it. I think this has happened. If, if this has happened, why can't they explain it then? Something's gone on, why can't they explain it? And, and, and I understand that. That's your human instinct reaction um, to something going wrong with these types of cases. But I do think you have to remind the client department and that's why this handout has been pulled together for their benefit to pass on if they need it. 
that actually that's not how the court looks at it. And in fact, the burden is entirely on us to show propensity, to show that this person could have done it, to prove that they've done it on the balance of probabilities, to prove that a pool of people, um, that there was a real possibility that a pool of people could have done this. Um, and also when we go for failure to protect, to show some knowledge obvious knowledge that a person should have had before. Um, so just always bear all of that in mind when you plan for these cases. And I think the best way to put in an AI case is to get it from the beginning and to refresh your memory on this basic law. And it is basic, but, but it's important law. Um, let the client department working on that case and the social worker, the manager, the supervisor, the service manager, refresh their memory on that. Um, gather evidence primary evidence and first or second hand evidence if you, if you can't get primary evidence um, as soon as possible and get that in and then when it comes to finalizing your threshold have a real discussion around how realistic it is to pursue certain things like failure to protect and take them out if it isn't but also a real discussion about managing expectations if you do have your squeaky clean parents um, so that's my view on how to properly manage and run those cases early on based on what we know of the basics of the law Let's turn to the expert evidence then. Now, I've written there the importance of medical evidence. Now, now we know as lawyers that the expert evidence is one part of the picture and it, it actually isn't decisive as much as we would like to think that it is. It's for the court to decide what's decisive, what, what the final decision is. Um, and I think it's quite important that we remind the client department of that um, because they get the expert report saying this is likely to be an AI and they hold on to that and they see that as the word. Um, and we need to remind them, especially in cases where the parents are squeaky clean, that no, the court will see that as one part of the picture, but we'll look at the picture as a whole. We'll look at the parents' records, probabilities, what they've got what wrong in their family that could have caused this. And if there's nothing, the court is, is less inclined to agree with the, that part of the expert report. Um, the court might agree this mechanism took force. The court might agree um, the child would have cried out and they should have known. But um, someone's asked the question, but um, the court may not go so far to agree with them that, that it's inflicted. Very interesting point. Should medical experts still be using the term NAI? There's, there's a large culture to say they shouldn't. Um, and in fact, more of them, I think, are moving towards inflicted, aren't they, um, as their way of referring to these things. Or they're simply saying, you know, it, it would have required a higher degree of force than normal handling. And the person who did it would have known or should have known that it was excessive. Some of them don't go further than that. Um, that's completely fine. I actually don't think they'll be criticised for saying NAI because some people still put NAI in threshold holes and you're not really meant it you're meant to say inflicted or describe it as I've just described it but actually sometimes if you put it in you make it very clear and fundamentally I think as well the judge doesn't like the way you worded it as long as they get the point they'll word it how they want when they make the finding won't they but they know what you're getting at um so no I don't think technically they're allowed to anymore or they shouldn't anymore but I don't think they're being criticized heavily for doing that because experts tend to of course say even though it's that it could be this. And so they get themselves out of trouble by looking unbalanced. Um, the court must also take into account that to the extent is appropriate, unknown causes. Um, and we, you all know what I mean by that because it's such good law, it's such rich law. Thanks, Sarah. Um, in that um, what, what we regard as, as, as causing an injury today will be something different tomorrow. Medical experts have been disproven over the years. And so the court will, of course, remember that there can be unknown, unknown causes for things at this stage in medical advancement. And it, it helps to remind the, the, ex, the client department that that is open to the court to go down that path as well. Um, we then have the issue of standard of proof. And of course, remind the client department of over dogmatic experts and the fact that the court will be cautious about that, that people, experts themselves have their own motives, they have their reputation on the line, they have their way that they view something as very clearly on the line. And we all do that as lawyers. I do that all the time in some cases. I think, no, that must be how you deal with it. That's the only way, that's the only way I've ever done it. <laughs> um, and of course, experts will be the same in how they approach this and the court will be very conscious of that. Then we have here, um, it is open to the court and the totality of the evidence to reach a conclusion which does not accord with that of the medical expert. That's important, I think, for advising. I think your social workers on the ground always get this, but I tend to find team managers, service managers and above, they struggle with that to understand that the court can go against the expert. But again, I think it's important to reiterate, reiterate to them, the court looks at the totality of the evidence, hears from the parents um, and can reach a different conclusion if it's so feels appropriate. Um, 
There can be other causes for injuries and ailments, and don't forget that. So, for instance, the case I've given you there, vitamin D deficiency and congenital rickets was considered the cause of the injury. And even if that's improbable, it's not impossible. And sometimes when you've got squeaky keen parents, the court goes for the improbable. Um, and don't exclude the possibility of having to withdraw, which is a difficult discussion to have with client departments. I entirely accept that. Um, and they don't want to withdraw cases. Um, but again, the reason I pulled out, pulled through this handout as, as an overview of the law first before we go into the practice next week or a fortnight or four weeks, you'll have to remind me, I can't remember when I'm doing the next one for this, is because sometimes they have to. Sometimes the evidence is just not there. Um, and one thing I was thinking as I was doing this was to consider and do a section of the law on the possibility of reopening cases, reopening findings, reopening allegations, because I thought actually, is that something that would sit nicely when advising the client department about these different options? Um, so if you think that that would be helpful for you to have the law on that to understand what cases, even if you don't pursue it in this case, you can do it next time might be helpful please let me know, but I thought that might be useful. It's important that they recognize, looking at the totality of what this document says. Um, Sarah's on it today. Sarah's like, yeah, that would be helpful. Thanks, Sarah, I'll put it on my list. <laughs> um, um, definitely helpful to understand options for the future. Yes, thank you guys. Then I shall bear that in mind, Claire. Um, then um, you have to be willing and ready to advise them that in fact, there may be cases where you just cannot take this further. Um, and of course, we all know that there are other considerations that go into these matters beyond this specific case. We like to think that it's not just cases or rather that we don't allow other things to influence our decision-making. But there are, at the end of the day, as representatives for the authority, any good lawyer for the authority, which all of the solicitors on this line will be, but any good counsel will advise you, bearing in mind, excuse me, the reputation of the authority by pursuing certain things, the impact that this may have on how the authority is seen when it brings matters in other cases, all of that is still relevant in a way as a side consideration. Um, and of course it is relevant when we look at this to go, have we got the evidence? And if we pursue this blindingly um, and without properly considering say a failure to protect as a bolt or, Will we be criticised for that? How will that impact on us as an authority? Um, so I've, I've, I've put there, don't exclude the possibility of having to withdraw. Almost as a, if you do agree with me and you're going to pass this on to the client department, um, we, um, if you do agree with me, you pass this on to the client department. Um, sorry, I've read the chat and I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> what was I talking about? I was talking about withdrawing. Oh, that was it. If you do agree with me, if you pass this handout on to the client department, they can see that as the end point of this to sort of say, look, we might have to think about that in future. Um, and it's therefore not a blindingly new notion to them when you might have to introduce that in conversation later. Um, so this is a very, very basic overview of the law in this area. But I hope it helps you as a starting point to understand when you get hit with a non-accidental injury, when you get hit with something that's inflicted and you've got these squeaky clean parents or these parents with lots of problems, where does the court start? Where does the burden lie in these matters? What should we reasonably be saying, i.e. failure to protect or not? Um, and when we get the expert evidence, what weight are we putting on it when we're doing our single assessments, our child and family assessments? What weight would the court put on it when we're thinking, mm, what's going to happen at finding a fact? I hope that this little summary gives us the overview. And I hope that it helps to break down certain suppositions. One, that the expert's weight is God in this, because it isn't. Um, two, that if the parents can't explain it, then there must have been something dodgy, because again, that's not how the court looks at it. Three, that failure to protect is just something to stick in there because they must fail to protect. Um, four, that um, as long as we have a record, that's the evidence. Actually, no, primary evidence is important and we must gather, gather, gather. Um, and five, when threshold comes through, make sure threshold can be justified on the facts of your case. And if it cannot, and there is another account of the injuries or a lack of evidence even to go there, um, do we need to be thinking strategically of whether we were drawn how to work with families without pursuing matters? Um, so this is probably the first one I've ever done where we finished five minutes early. That's always my aim because now I can take any questions. Does anyone have any questions for me um, on this particular seminar or anything else you wanted to ask me about um, relating to this topic? Will you post this video following? Yeah, they all go on YouTube and I checked the YouTube channel for Spy Barristers the other day and I am very popular on there. <laughs> so, um, so by all means, go and look at any of my videos on there. Um, 
Anything else, guys? Let me ask you this. Did most of you know this before I went into it? I suspect you probably did, but it'd be useful to know. No one's responding. Yes, Catherine's like, yes, Reagan, I knew all of that. <laughs> Thank you. Most of it, but good to refresh. Yeah. Um, no, I am new in my role. It has been helpful to hear this and have the handout. Yeah, great. Wonderful, guys. I'm useful. I'm glad that, in fact, it was useful to you. Um, as I said, it's something that I think, not all of it, I'm a social work student, very helpful. Oh, bless you. Sorry, I didn't realise social workers were on here as well, but I hope that that is helpful to you guys. As I said, keep this handout. It's useful as a refresher because if, if you haven't covered one in six months or something like that, um, then you want to revisit that. Um, and secondly, if you get them, it's useful to put to the client department early on so they understand the reasoning and the thinking before you even go any further. Um, so what I'm going to say is I'm going to put my email in the box again one final time. Um, and I'm going to say if either you don't have the handout um, you email me for it. And secondly, if you have either any feedback or any topics that you want me to address or any questions arising out of this, please let me know, guys. And I hope that that was useful for your short lunch and adjournment where you all give up time to join me. Um, I'm joining you again, I think, in three or four weeks to part two of this, which is which is kind of linked together because we're going to go through now that you know the law what kind of things strategically we should be doing as we go through um, and receive these types of cases. Um, so other than that, I am going to love you and leave you. And thank you for attending. Let me just check to make sure no one's asked anything. Hi, Joe. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Okay, someone's emailed me saying, where is the handout? Just let me email me and I'll give it to you. That is it, I think. Okay, then, guys, go and enjoy your lunch. Speak to you later. Bye.